actually primarily did two things. What we did is we um, designed restaurants and church projects, so which we continue to do to this day. We have a lot of church projects, a lot of Catholic church projects, but we have restaurant uh, projects uh, since the beginning. I think 1948 or 49 is when uh, we started doing the restaurant projects, and we did the first church projects in 1947. So, uh, and we just continued on those uh, two. I mean, we did other work uh, as we progressed after 60 years. You know, you're bound to do a certain amount of houses and that sort of thing. But uh, again, right now, we're doing what we did uh, 50, 60 years ago. I first went to work for the firm in 1963 when I was still in college. I basically just took the job because I couldn't get any other work. And it's kind of funny. Uh, all of my family have always been in in some sort of hospitality business. At one time, my grandfather owned a hotel in Washington, failed by the way, but he still owned a hotel. My other grandfather was in the food business. By uh, he was a fruit, a fruit broker. He would buy and sell. Um, uh, crops of fruit and ship it all over the United States and my other cousins were in the packing house businesses and the rest of them were in transporting of the fruit and trucking business and that's where everything was all in the food and when I was in college I was in Notre Dame and they somebody came around and asked me if uh, asked the students if anybody wanted to become a restaurant draftsman during the afternoons and I needed the money I was constantly broke you know so um, not poor, but I was broke. But I was always broke. I never thought I was poor. I just never had any money. So anyway, I, I took this job as a restaurant equipment draftsman in the afternoons. They'd come and pick me up, and my drafting table was on a, uh, um, a stairwell landing, if you can believe this, with a light hanging down over this drafting board. And I would sit there and draft up uh, kitchens. So I got to know what a kitchen was. And I got to know how a restaurant worked. And I thought, geez, I'll never use this in 100 years. So what do I do? I come out, uh, and I think it was my second or third job in an architectural firm. It's always in the summer, I always got architectural jobs. I go to work for Army and Davis, and all of a sudden I realized I knew more about food service equipment than anybody around. You know, a lot of these, I mean, I was in the business, and here I am just a college student. And it was kind of a kick, and I just kind of like morphed into it, you know, bang, you know, you're starting to do this kind of stuff. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, I learned that a restaurant and we knew in our business as the restaurant designers that it is a food factory. Forget about everything else. Location is great, You've gotta have a good location. What are you really doing? You're produce, you're a food factory. The food goes, uh, raw materials come in the back door, it's prepared and goes out to the front. If you screw up the, the way it's delivered to the front, to the, uh, uh, to the flow of how this restaurant works, you're gonna ruin your, uh, your, your client. Your building isn't gonna work. So the, one of the first things, forget about the great design, does this thing flow properly? Does this work properly? Are the stations in the proper locations? Are the cooking and the dishwashing done? Is it, is it where it should be? Are you gonna hear the dishwashing in the restaurant? You don't want that to happen you want to be able to have a certain amount of sounds because the restaurant has to have a life to itself. Um, you know, that was important. The color that we used in these restaurants in these coffee shops were bright and cheerful. And you know, one of the reasons why we did that, because we didn't want you to linger there. We didn't want you to stay there. We want you to have a good experience there, but we want you to come and we wanted you to turn over that table. I talked to Sterling Bogart, who's now deceased at Norms. He was the president of Norms for years. And he said, as far as he was concerned, he'd put a time clock in front of the, on each one of the chairs or each one of the tables. And if you ate fast, you got a discount because he wanted to turn this thing. What we're trying to do was to try to design projects which were open to the outside. It's a car culture after World War II. So people were interested in, um, in cars and, uh, um, and airplanes and speed and um, the restaurants had to be a kind of accommodate this in some respects because 
uh, we were looking for restaurants that had a lot of glass, that you looked inside the buildings and saw a lot of animation, a lot of color, a lot of light, like in nighttime in particular, you would see um, not just the people, the animation of the people, but you would even see cooks and you'd see waitresses and you saw things happening as you went down the street you want to kind of come in there and be part of this uh, all glass exteriors all open we tried to integrate the uh, landscaping as an example in Southern California we could do that more than let's say on the East Coast but uh, though we did a lot of um, a lot of our projects were done on the East Coast and in the Midwest we just simply uh, tried to integrate uh, the landscaping and the light and uh, uh, again, this animation. You're able to have a lot of glass expanses like on the East Coast, you're not. Because it, uh, you have uh, heat, uh, you know, you have loss of heat, air conditioning, uh, the heating bills become staggering. But we used to uh, counterman that by uh, going with uh, better glass materials and things like that, double glow panes, uh, trying to figure out how to do our air conditioning systems differently back there. and. Uh, but here you were able to pull off things that were, the indoors and outdoors could be married together much easier than let's say on the, on the East Coast. Uh, like in the 1930s you had the, I would say the streamline, streamlining look, but you had the streamlining of uh, not only of, uh, of trains, but you had streamlining of buildings as well. The Coca-Cola building here in Los Angeles is a prime example of one of streamlining architecture. But when you got into after World War II, we all of a sudden come, came up with jet planes and, and speed, fins on cars, and so a lot of times our architecture uh, reflected itself in uh, wing designs. Uh, Norms is a classic example of a wing. It just floats and it's just there. I think even Denny's was somewhat like that in some respects. Uh, we would take variations of the wing design uh, and had uh, um, like for, um, I'm trying to think, uh, the Huddle restaurants. In one case we even had a uh, airport tower as an example. We even put that into one of our buildings to make it look like an airport tower. Anything that would go with speed, airplanes and, and that uh, sort of thing. Like Pans is an example. Uh, again, the roof sort of like floated over the main space and we wanted it to float. Uh, we would even go to the point of having glass coming together and butt the glass together and not have a structural column as an example. There would be structure, but we would try to hide it as much as we could. Or we would make the, the structure be part of, literally part of the design and minimize it the buildings were safe because they were usually done in steel and that sort of thing, so they were really raw design buildings. But we wanted everything to kind of float. And the, the uh, roofs had to, to uh, catch your eye as you came down, and they all had to be different. Uh, Denny's couldn't look like a Pans, as an example. Pans looked different. Norms should not look like a, uh, a Denny's. The Bob's Big Boy, as an example, had a completely different roof. It was kind of like a curved roof. And, but again, they all floated. And the use of the materials, too, uh, like we used an awful lot of uh, stone work, natural materials, glass, but in the inside we then went ahead and uh, hired a whole stable of, of uh, artists to come in and do special light fixtures. The clocks, the screens between the booths, uh, the artwork that's on the walls. Everything was custom for these uh, projects. And we worked with these really great, really good artists. I'd say really great artists. A lot of them are, are gone. Some of them were refugees from Europe too. I mean, we had one guy uh, uh, that uh, escaped from Hitler and he worked for, uh, for us and did a lot of our work and uh, with his wife, uh, Betsy, uh, uh, Hans Werner was his name. and. Uh, Betsy Hancock, uh, they were really fine artists that didn't necessarily want to do our kind of work. I mean, they would rather have done artwork, and I have a lot of their, I have some of their artwork at home, 
they couldn't sell their artwork. So they had to make a living. So we would hire these guys and they would come in and they would do whatever we wanted in these restaurants. And it, some of the artwork was pretty wild. You'll see back over in the, in the corner there one of the examples of one of these freeform screens that we had. We kept it. Um, and you can see the artwork that I had. Again, they couldn't, they couldn't sell their artwork. But we kept them employed. We kept a lot of people employed like that. Um, I was trying to think, um, Iris Spector was an example. Now he wasn't necessarily a, an artist per se, like a, an artiste. He was, he was basically, he did artwork for our restaurants and so he would, he would do great signs and all that sort of thing. And even the signs, we'll go back onto the signs. We designed our own signs on the outsides of the buildings. Norms as an example was designed by Eldon Davis, the Norm sign. The washing and flashing of the neon going up and down on the sign, kind of like dancing, the way Helen Fong explained. Helen Fong used to be with our firm, she's deceased. Uh, but Helen um, designed it so that it, uh, this thing could actually like dance. This, it had to move. Everything was designed in the office as being like one of a kind. Uh, we would help them with even the menus and the way the uh, waiters and wait persons would, uh, would dress. We go do the whole thing. The, the type of, of crockery, the small wares that are going to be on the table, how they're going to be uh, uh, presented. We would work with specialized designers just for that alone. It was a complete job. In California, remember, there was uh, all of this crazy architecture, as an example. You had uh, restaurants were shaped like a uh, derby hat, brown derby. You had uh, restaurants were shaped like um, ice cream cones donuts, you know, all that sort of thing. That's really roadside architecture. You know, you, that's a different style of architecture. The architecture we tried to come up with was something which was the, con what we considered modern architecture that attracted people, not a gimmick necessarily. It actually embraces a lot of the feeling of the international style. And uh, I think it was intentionally meant to do that. So it was directly influenced by the international style, no question about it. It was, remember it was done right after World War II, and during World War II, of course, we had no construction going on here in the United States, for that matter, anywhere, other than war production. So right after World War II, you had this pent up demand and people wanted things that were different and uh, they wanted a, they created different, we created different things to, to meet their demands. When we found that we had a particular style of architecture that was successful, we tried to expand on this style of architecture and uh, try to improve it and to do things differently for other people and other uh, clients. I don't know if necessarily the East Coast establishment reacting. I, I remember it from the people that we dealt with here in California. We considered the finer architects in, in California. I think they looked down upon the architecture that we were producing. Because uh, we were producing really architecture for the masses. Uh, all of our buildings were for everybody to come into and see and enjoy. It was maybe an elitist look at way for architects, the concepts of what a building should be. The modernism of the Baja School and uh, let's say Richard Neutra's works, which were excellent, were not really for the masses. They were for people that had the money to buy them. Really, think about it. They could afford these kind of buildings. Um, our architecture was geared towards anybody being able to come in and see them and to take part in these, in these buildings. They may not have understood why they liked to come into these buildings at all. They may not have understood it at all. But I think that they felt like, they felt good when they came into the buildings. We wanted people to, be, to feel good other than the fact we wanted them to come in and get out. So, but people like to be around other people. I don't go into a restaurant if I don't see a lot of people in that restaurant, you know. So you're attracting people into a restaurant, possibly by the architecture, which hopefully you are, is one facet, good food, good value, um, the whole dining experience. And w it was very important for us to try to pick restaurant operators that really were good restaurant operators. I don't want to work for a loser. I'm sorry. I don't want to do, do somebody that doesn't know what he's doing. 
I wanted somebody that's professional in their field. And I think that some of these, these people like Norm Roebark let the architecture and the architects be architects. Boy, that's important. A lot of the clients don't want us to be architects. They just basically, you know, do what I tell you to do and all that sort of thing. They've kind of killed the, the, the I don't know what you call the, the heart of, of what we were trying to do. But to get, an to get somebody to let us do whatever we wanted was wonderful. God, you know, I did do houses. I'll tell you, my one thing of houses is really kind of funny. I worked for um, Quincy Jones, Jones and Emmons. And I did Eichler houses. Joe Eichler. You know, it's funny. You, you're with all of these people at the time, and you think, eh, you know, so, so what? This guy was a, uh, a developer of very innovative, clean uh, tract houses, which were all post and beam architecture. And Joe Eichler was a great person to work for. I mean, you, and, but I worked for Jones and Emmons, and I did some of the drawings. I didn't do the designs. I did the drawings for some of the one of the Eichler houses or a set of uh, ones that he was doing up in Palo Alto. In fact, I was trying to find the drawings and I never could find them. I have them someplace in the house. But uh, God, I learned a tremendous amount from just doing a house. All post and beam, all glass, all exposed, a lot of light coming down and how the light came in diffused inside the buildings. That was another important thing in our, our restaurants. The light from the outside really had to come into the buildings. You didn't want to feel enclosed. The minute you put an enclosed wall on a building, you then have to create the atmosphere within the enclosed wall, if you understand what I'm saying. What you want is you want the inside to be outside. Same. Now, we did a lot of restaurants where we had to, like we did uh, Polynesian restaurants, which you had to do that. That was different. That's a different genre. What killed off the coffee shops, of course, was fast food. That's the ultimate. You go over and get your own. You know, and the coffee shops in general, uh, they can't compete. So what do we do? We go into the fast food business. So now it's what we do. It's all these fast food places. I think it's a unique time. Right now, um, what we have, we're doing, uh, as an example right now, we're doing El Pollo Loco restaurants. And we've got like 30 some odd on board, 30, 40 of them. I don't know. I lost count. We were doing Del Tacos, and uh, we got a couple of those, and uh, some Taco Bells, too. We got five. We're looking at five re renovations. Um, we have done uh, Burger Kings in the past, like 30, 40 at a time. They usually end up hiring corporate people to do all their design work. In other words, they'll hire different. They'll, they will not hire necessarily an architect to do an entire package like this anymore at all. Uh, El Pollo Loco has their own people that they bring in to give them their images, you know, what this is our image for the day. And so we find ourselves with these, these incorporating these images that are given to us. So we're not doing the entire design package anymore at all, which is a shame. But we do for churches. So it's interesting, we still do it for the churches. And people say, well, you know, it's a church job and it's a restaurant job, they're completely dissimilar. Public buildings, Right now I'm doing a, a project which is under construction up in uh, Santa Clarita and it seats uh, 1,400 people and it's all glass, you know, it's all glass. And you can see in, and you can see nature, you know, you can see the, 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 the I cite it so that I can see the, the hills and, and everything in the background within the church. It's got a lot of the principles that we used to do in the, in the restaurants. Historically, people look with nostalgia on previous generations. I imagine if I were living in the 1930s, I probably would have looked back in the gay 90s and said, wow, that's a great time. But was it really a great time? I don't know. We look back on this style of architecture because we're no longer, we're no longer producing it anymore. And the architecture that the good pieces that we do have that are still there are rare. And, uh, you know, we, we're, we're saying now, well, we should preserve this architecture, which I think they should in some cases. What do I think about it? I think it's great. It's just human nature to go back and want to uh, remember things like that. You know, somebody can do a coffee shop as an example. And I've seen a lot of ripoffs of our work. You know, they did a coffee shop. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't understand it. We knew what we were going to do. We had certain philosophy that we were following. We always knew 
As an example, we always knew that the bulkheads on a restaurant, you know, the bulkheads where the uh, glass starts, has to be at about two feet off the ground, not three feet off the ground because it hides too much inside. Most of our restaurants have very low bulkheads because we wanted to see what was going on. You go into these restaurants and they wouldn't understand that concept. That's a small concept. What kind of lighting do you have? Well, you know, they'll say, well, we'll just dump a bunch of fluorescent lighting in these restaurants and hope for the best. The lighting was just an integral part of the design. It's, it's like you, you get the, the knowledge of how to design these buildings from the experience and, and it's more, it's the detailing. It, it's the, the finer things that, that make the design a good design. Um, sometimes you get these buildings that I've seen and they, they've lost their heart. You know, they've lost their, their meaning. They don't know why they're doing it. Um, maybe we didn't know why we were doing it either. But we, we loved what we were doing. And we were trying to do something which was different. And we always constantly strove to do things differently. And when I personally never liked any of the projects I've done. I've never been satisfied with them. I, 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 I build them and I walk away from them and I think to myself, boy, I could have done better than that. You know, I, and it's a horrible feeling, but I love doing it. I enjoy it. Architecture is just, I've never wanted to become anything other than an architect. Love architecture, but never been satisfied. What a hell of a note. Never been satisfied.